Welcome. I hope everybody had a good party last night. And uh, good morning, so everybody's gotten into it. Um, there's going to be no code at all in this entire presentation. So it's a good warm-up for lunch, I guess. <laughs> um, before I really start talking about what I'm going to start talking about, I want to ask you some questions. And you don't have to answer out loud, but I want you to answer to yourself. So first, I'm going to ask you to think about going to the hairdresser. I want you to think if you've ever been actually afraid of going to the hairdresser. Actually afraid of being verbally assaulted, even maybe physically assaulted, for going to the hairdresser. And the reason why I ask this is because this is a problem that trans people have. If you are a trans man and you go to the hairdresser and they can tell that you are a trans man, then there have been several episodes of trans men being assaulted by the hairdresser because the hairdresser thinks that they are trying to lure them to pay less for their haircuts. Because male ha haircuts or haircuts for men are cheaper than haircuts for women. Planning a vacation. We've all planned vacations, right? And that's nice, you sit around thinking, do you want to go to the beach? Or is it a good place to bring the kids? Is it expensive? How far is it to fly? Gay people, same-sex couples and trans people, they have to pay attention to a whole other set of parameters. Can they be arrested in this country? Can they be killed for being who they are? A whole large portions of the world are not accessible to go on vacation for a same-sex couple. So the talk is called Deconstructing Privilege. Um, my name is Patricia Oss. I am normally a programmer, <laughs> um, a C++ programmer, which is a community that is mostly uh, consists of men, uh, unfortunately. So please, if you want to learn how to program C++, <laughs> I'm on Twitter. But uh, during the last few months, I've been helping form a co uh, an organization is called a hash include C++, and it's basically to try to help with diversity and inclusion in C++, and I'm not going to talk about that at all, but if you're interested, I'm on Twitter. <laughs> so what I'm going to start with, uh, and this is the foundation of the talk, but I'm not going to talk, it's not the meat of the talk, but it's the foundation of the talk. So it's the four stages of competence, and most people are familiar with this. It's basically the idea of going from something unconscious incompetence, so you are not aware that you don't know. So these are the famous unknown unknowns, the things that you don't know that you're incompetent in. Uh, as people might call you ignorant in this stage, uh, but basically your intuition is wrong. You think you have an intuition and you think it's right, but it's actually wrong. The, the difficult part of being unconscious incompetence is that you don't know that this is where you are. So when you move from there to the next stage, you come to conscious incompetence. In conscious incompetence, you know that you don't know what you're talking about. It's a good start. It's a really good start because that's when you start to do your research, right? That's when you start to learn. And when you've done your research and you've done everything and you, you, you're starting to get into the topic, then you're moving over to conscious competence. You actually you have the data, you form conclusions, you have a sound analysis. The thing is, it seems like this is something that will flow naturally into the last column, this unconscious competence. But in my experience, there, most people will never be able to bridge the gap between conscious competence and unconscious competence. And I'll give you an example on why that is difficult. So we're going to swear in a foreign language. <laughs> And this is, I'm using this example because most people can relate to this example, right? If you learn a language you don't know anything in, most people, if you learn less than 10 words in a language, a few of those will be swear words. <laughs> that is just 
what people do, right? And it's kind of fun to swear in a foreign language, and especially those under 10 words languages, because you don't know anything else, and it's kind of fun. Uh, as you learn more of a language, then you're starting to wonder, maybe this is offensive, maybe I shouldn't do this. Actually, I don't know how offensive this thing is. And then you're starting to wonder, you know, like, okay, so maybe I should talk to people who speak this language, you know? And then you're slowly but surely building up something to a point where you're quite fluent in the language and it's definitely offensive. There's like no doubt, this is definitely offensive, I should not say this thing. But there, is, there has been studies done on people who speak uh, a language as their native language and people who are very fluent in that language, but it's not their native language, and how they react to swear words. And people who are native language speakers, this is their language, they have, they have an actual physical reaction. They have cortisol levels rising when people swear. And that doesn't happen. Even though you're really, really fluent, if it's not your mother tongue, you don't have that same reaction. So if you notice here that when you're consciously competent, you go like, that is definitely offensive. But when you're con unconscious competent in this language, you just say, that's rude. You don't say that. That's rude. And when people say, but why? Like, like, for example, in English, in English, using the word bloody can be very rude, uh, which in most other languages you're going like, okay, I don't know that, why that's rude. But it is rude. And a native the speaker will just say, it's rude. I can't tell you why it's rude. It just is. And that's why I'm saying going from being consciously competent to being unconsciously competent is very difficult because you are basically talking to someone who has it ingrained in who they are. And it's not necessarily something that you're able to do. So I'm saying don't aim for that. Aim for consciously competent. It's a good goal. So we're going to talk about privilege today. And we can imagine being unconsciously incompetent in this topic, you will say privilege is a myth. I don't believe this is a problem because I don't experience this. And this is, again, a wrong intuition, because you're measuring somebody else's experience through your own experience. And if you don't experience what they are experiencing, then your intuition is wrong. This is very difficult, and that is a big part of what I'm going to try to, to convince you of today, that there are people around you who live a lived experience that is completely different from yours, in many central aspects. And when you realize that their lived life is different from yours, then you realize also that you don't know anything about their life. And the good thing about becoming consciously incompetent, and it seems like a very low goal, but it is a central goal, is because you start listening to people. You start wanting to learn from them. And so that is the whole build-up of the talk. But we're going to start from the beginning. Because what is privilege? I've used the word several times, but what does it mean? And what do I mean by it when I say it? Most people have experienced hardship. You'd be surprised on people that you work with every day and the things that they carry around inside of them that you don't know. Real massive pains and troubles that they have now or they've had in the past that you don't know about. Most people have experienced hardship. Many people have not lived good lives. But you can't tell. But privilege <coughs> is being spared a particular type of hardship. Your life might not have been great, but this specific thing, you didn't get that one. When you talk about your partner, you're talking about maybe you're going to go on vacation or that your partner uh, is applying for new jobs or that your partner is making dinner for you. Do you worry about what word, what pronoun you use when you talk about your partner? Is this something that gives you not in your stomach that you're afraid that you're going to say the wrong thing one day? And the, the consequences for, for a same-sex couple could be massive. It depends on where you live and it depends on the, the environment that you're in. 
Uh, it could be something small as being ostracized or people talk about you behind your back. It's like, oh, did you know she's gay? Uh, but it could be massive. It could be in the wrong place. Somebody's, you're in a bar with your colleagues and somebody screams, oh my God, you're gay? And then you, it's late at night, you have to walk from their home. This could result in you being physically assaulted. But this is not something that heterosexual couples worry about. Has anyone at work ever asked you how you have sex with your partner? Now this is a ridiculous thing, like why would anyone do this? It's a crazy thing, like how do you physically have sex with your partner? It doesn't make any sense. This happens to, it happens to gay people, or it happens to same-sex couples, but it also happens a lot, even more, to transsexual people. People have, for some reason, think it is perfectly fine to ask a transsexual person how they have sex with their partner. It's like you don't know this person and you're walking up and asking them physiologically, excuse me, but I want to know what happens underneath the covers at home. <laughs> Is this, is, if you ask a heterosexual person this question, they will be like, what is wrong with you? But for some reason, people think this is perfectly acceptable to ask transsexual people. Has anyone at work ever commented on your weight? Said, you know what, you could afford to lose some pounds, you know? Or, I think you're getting, like, you're getting a little bit fat, aren't you? Or even, you're, you've lost a lot of weight. Are you anorexic? <laughs> What's wrong with you? Why, why on God's... I don't know why anybody would think this was any of their business, but for some reason, people have made it socially acceptable to bully people that are overweight, especially. But even people who are underweight, and you don't know why somebody is underweight, they could be sick. And they might not want to talk about that with you. Has anyone at work ever asked you what your genitalia looks like? This is kind of crazy, right? <laughs> it's like, excuse me, John, I was wondering. <laughs> this happens to transsexual people, transgender people all the time. All the time. It's so that they get tired of hearing this question. Some, a question you've never gotten in your entire life is something that transgender people are tired of hearing. It's not just once. It's because people want to know, like, uh, excuse me, but I'd like to know what you look like naked. I'm like, it's none of your business. We're never going to have anything. <laughs> Has anyone ever shushed you in a meeting? You're sitting there with your colleagues and you're talking and at a certain point somebody goes like, shh. Happens to women all the time. Women get constantly shushed in meetings. I've never seen a man be shushed in my entire life. I've seen men do the craziest shit in meetings. <laughs> they have been screaming, yelling, banging the table, with, and all sorts of things, like, and calling people names I've seen in meetings. I've never seen a man being shushed ever. I've been shushed many times. Never done any of the previous things. Are you expected to always be meek and accommodating? This is, this is something that hits women very hard. We're supposed to be nice. If we are not always accommodating to the people around us, if we are not like, excuse me, I'm alive, I'm, excuse me, I'm here, excuse me that I'm a talking, uh, if we are not apologetic for it, opening our mouths, people think we are rude, people think we are angry. If we don't have a smile on our face, we are accused of being angry and can get some things like, maybe you should smile a little more. People would like you more. <laughs> you should say that to all your male colleagues. I'm sure they'll appreciate it. <laughs> this is also something that they end up doing a lot of what is considered to be office housework. Like, you know, like, Jane, can you go get the coffee? Or, you know, Joan, can you do, do, take notes? All of those things that you, you end up having the single woman in your team doing all sorts of chores for you, like she was your mother. Are certain jobs unavailable to you because of language or accent? 
Many people who are not living in their birth country uh, might have problems getting jobs because of language or accent. Not knowing the language well enough to have these jobs, which means that the number of jobs they can take is very limited. This makes them vulnerable, right? Because now they can't leave a toxic environment necessarily because it's very hard to get another job. Vulnerable people who have a trouble getting other jobs could be other people as well. People with physical disabilities might be very afraid of trying to change jobs. Do people ridicule you as a parent because of your gender? This is something that happens to men a lot. Somehow it is okay to, to laugh at men being bad parents. You would never laugh at a female colleague and the butt of the joke is that she's a bad mother, right? But for some reason, we make fun of men as parents. And men often suffer as parents uh, in many contexts. They're not taken seriously. If the doctor calls because of something, they'll often call the mother. Even though the father's, father was the one that brought the child, they will still call the mother. Uh, kindergarten will do the same. Men will be, be, uh, be spoken down to in any kind of situation dealing with government, and they will often talk with the mother. This is a very painful topic for men who want to be engaged in their children's lives because it happens again and again. And then you go to work and then somebody makes fun of you saying men can dress their kids. And you're going like, what? I bring my kid to kindergarten every freaking morning. That's, my, that's what I do. I make lunch and I dress my kid. Of course I can dress my kid. Why would this be funny? Do you get time off for your religious holidays? I asked my husband this. And he said, no. He's an atheist. <laughs> So I told him he got extra. Um, but in Norway, for example, the, the Christian holidays, you get everybody gets them off. But what if you're Muslim? So you might be entitled to get unpaid leave off for your religious holidays. But you'll see that these things are not the same. Because in Norway, if you work on a Christian holiday, you get extra pay because this is like an inconvenience too, because we assume that everyone is celebrating a Christian holiday. But what about having to be forced to work on your religious holidays? You don't get compensated for that. Do people refuse to use your name and instead use a painful name? You can try to imagine this as somebody actively using a bully name, like something that you recalled as a child that hurt. This is something that happens a lot to transgender people. It's something that they call dead naming. It's people who refuse to use their chosen name and keeps on using the name that they had before they transition, transitioned. This is very painful. And it's painful even in ways that you might not imagine. Like imagine that you transitioned at work. So you have lots of commits in the code base with your old name. And it keeps coming up like you're editing files and this name will keep on. And this is an incredibly painful thing for transgender people. Have you ever worried that, about whether you could attend an event at all? And if you notice these beautiful, beautiful stairs here, you don't have to have that many stairs before a person in a wheelchair can't attend. You need one step. But even if we take away the accessibility part as well, then you end up with women often choosing not to attend professional contexts that involve alcohol because they know that when their colleagues drink they might be sexually harassed and they don't want that even even you don't want that for yourself but you don't really want to face that person the next day so you don't really want that for them either 
You don't want them to be that, and that is going to be at work, and it's never going to stop. This person will always be awkward because they know they did this thing, and now it's your problem because now this pro person won't work with you anymore, and this whole thing can just kind of escalate much further than this one party. But also, you have to walk home from this place, right? Alone, because when you go to a professional context, you're generally not going with your partner, so now you're going home alone at night, so you might think, you know what, I'm just going to leave after dinner. After one drink, while everybody's pretty, pretty sober, I'm just going to go home. Has anyone asked you if you belonged at an event? This happens to a lot of people, for different reasons. Uh, for some reason, people think that you don't look the part, you don't look like you belong. And that could be because you're a woman, it could be because you have dark skin, it could be for many different reasons that people will assume that you are not technical. Or maybe that you're staff. Or even worse, that you're a booth babe because you're wearing a dress. <laughs> so we've talked about privileges, and I'm going to list some types of privileges. And then you can think about to yourself what kinds of privileges you might have. Because that is my point here, we all have some types of privileges. In some ways, we have all been spared. So you have sexual orientation, where heterosexuality has, uh, has triumphed in dictating all sorts of popular culture. But gender identity, and gender identity here, I'm saying that do you identify with your birth gender, the one you were assigned at birth? If you do, that is generally called cisgender. That means you're not transgender. If you're cisgender, that's generally a much easier path in life. And then you have your gender. Men will, in some cases, have it easier than women. And, and, and easier than non-binary or other types of gender identities. But not always. Like we saw with pa being parents. Sometimes it sucks to be a man, too. Ability. Are you able-bodied? Because this could be a big deal. Like, I read about a company that said that ev all the employees had to, to have standing desks. In this business, having back problems is, like, very common. Imagine that you had to stand all day at work, or... I don't know. I don't know what you do with... <laughs> Age. For some reason in this business, people think that uh, working hard in a field for 10, 20, 30 years for somehow makes you less competent. I'm not really sure how that works. For some reason, we, we think that young people in their early 20s are extremely brilliant, uh, whereas they generally don't know much, but they have a lot of confidence. I'll give them that. <laughs> But that generally comes with unconscious comp incompetence, okay? People think they know everything. <laughs> so then you have racial, racial or ethnic. If people can tell looking at you that you are not white, then this can cause you friction in many cases. Many people will often think that you are more angry. People might be, especially, especially um, dark-skinned men, uh, might have the problem that they can never ever raise their voice. They can never be angry at all, or in any way, because people become afraid of them. So they are generally the nicest, kindest, most soft-spoken people you find, because they have to compensate from that bias and everybody else. Language. We've talked a little bit about language. But speaking the language, or speaking the language well, can be a differentiator. Citizenship. This is another one that is kind of scary, because again, it comes to options, right? If you have moved your family to a country, and you're living there, and, and the entire residency, and you living in this country, and your family living in this country, hinges on this one job, are you going to risk it? To speak up? when people are harassing you at work. And then you have religion, especially if the religion is somehow visible in your clothing. 
But then you have something that most people can probably relate to, socioeconomic background, class, accent, education, things that might open doors for you or close them. If you grew up, th there are things that most people don't think about. If you grow up poor, you really don't know how to behave in these upper class contexts. You don't know how to eat in a fancy restaurant because you've never eaten in a fancy restaurant in your life. You don't know how to, to save or invest or any of these things and you can't ask your family because nobody in your family knows either. But this is the last one. And I think it shows exactly how arbitrary privilege is, really. It is something that is called passing privilege. And you can have that in any of these categories. You can have passing privilege. Passing privilege means that when people look at you, they think you have this, they think you have this privilege. And because they think so, you have it. You know that these things might not be true. Like, for example, people might look at you and think you're able-bodied, but they might not know that you have a chronic disease. And that means that you are struggling every day, taking, taking IV drips in the morning and, and, and at night, and you have to take constant medication, and you might die any minute. But it, people can't tell looking at you. And so you might be able to pass. I grew up with passing privilege. I am a half Latin American, half Norwegian. I am the whitest person you have ever met. <laughs> but I was not the only one who grew up half Norwegian, half Latin American. We were a bunch of kids that did. I am the whitest one. And there was a gradient. But I have to tell you that each and every one except me grew up facing racism. From grown-ups and other kids, all through our lives, they faced racism being told things like they couldn't participate in the 17th of May parade because they weren't Norwegian. Do you think I was ever told anything like that? I had a guy in my class who was a nationalist. That's what they call themselves when they don't want to say what they are. He liked me. He really liked me. He, he, and he was really always super nice to me. He knew that I was only half Norwegian, but I was different. <laughs> That's what they say. Yeah, 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 everybody, all of those people are like that, but not you, because you're different. <laughs> because it's always the ones that you know that are different, right? <laughs> so I have passing privilege in, in, in several other ways as well, but we can get into that in another, another talk, I guess. But basically, I can pass in many ways, and that makes me very privileged, because it means that I can live with, with these advantages, right? But it also means that I grew up feeling ashamed. I was ashamed of being white because my life was easier. Because privilege is being spared a hardship. I felt ashamed because I didn't share that hardship with the other kids. And that's a strange thing, saying I should suffer like you. <laughs> Because, uh, because what we really want to do instead is to say that I don't want you to suffer either. You should have it as good as me. So privilege, saying that you're privileged can give you that idea that I want you to have it like me. You shouldn't have it shitty. You shouldn't have this hardship because your skin is darker or because your gender is different than mine. I want you to have it as good as me. This is the hardest part of the talk. Because this is the one that's probably going to make people angry and uncomfortable. <laughs> but I want to do it now because the thing is, when you go out from this talk, I want you to go and I want you to listen to people. And I want you to learn from them. But then I want you to also be conscious of how you speak could be problematic for them. So we're going to look at some patterns in problematic communication, and then I'm going to show you some examples. Patterns in problematic communication, I got these. Uh, they're inspired from a thread and threads in that thread and so on uh, from a woman called Erin Brooke. And she talks about a competitive communication style. 
So I'm going to go through them one at a time. So a, com a competitive communication style, the point is to win. You're in it to win. Then you're not in it to learn from the other person, you're in it to win. So, so in some way you can change what you're arguing about, you can try to reframe what they're saying. The whole point in the entire talk or conversation is to somehow make them lose. It's not a learning activity, it's, it's a destructive activity, you're trying to win. I have, a, I have a saying I say to my daughter, it's from Dr. Phil, it's one of the good things Dr. Phil has ever said. He, has, uh, uh, he said once, do you want to be right or do you want to be married? <laughs> this, is, this is the point, that with a competitive communication style, the point is to destroy your opponent. <laughs> if your opponent is your wife, this is not a good thing. Do you want to be right or do you want to be married? She has interpreted this to mean something for the entire world. This is a metaphor in our family. Anyway, the second one is downplaying issues and concerns. So downplaying issues and concerns, you're basically saying, it's not that bad. You know, calm down, you're overreacting. Don't be so dramatic. Basically, I don't believe you. Third one is interpreting people of color and women as angry. You have to be so super nice all the time as a woman and as a person of color, because if not, people will interpret you as angry. Remember what I said about the men in the meeting screaming and shouting and banging the table? They were passionate. <laughs> when I grow up, I want to be passionate. <laughs> Because, because I can hardly even get a stern tone before people tell me to calm down. <laughs> And the last one is not trusting women's experiences and expertise. And this is something that I think you have to think about over time. Like, like when a woman says something to you and you distrust it a little bit, try to think if a man told you this thing, would you feel the same way? Because this thing is built into the fabric of our societies. We think women exaggerate. We think women don't speak the truth. We think they're framing it in some way. So we stop listening and we tell them, you know what, it's not that bad. Don't be so dramatic, okay? So now we're going to look at some examples. What you should notice is that these things are uh, rarely done accidentally or in good faith. People pretend they're in good faith and people pretend they're done accidentally, but they're generally not. But it doesn't mean that you meant it badly, but you meant it. <laughs> and they're often paired with a refusal to back off. When you notice somebody is being hurt, somebody is being damaged by your communication style, you just continue, go on. So you have sea lining. Sea lining is named after a cartoon. So I, I'll put up the cartoon and then I'll read the cartoon. And it has three vo voices, and so that's going to be hard, but I'll try. <laughs> Okay, so you have a man and a woman, they're sitting in like this toy train. Um, and the woman says, I don't mind most marine mammals, but sea lions, I could do without sea lions. And the man says, don't say that out loud. And then a sea lion appears, of course. It's like, pardon me, I couldn't help but over here. Now you've done it, says the man. I would like to have a civil conversation about your statement. Would you mind showing me evidence of any negative thing a sea, any sea lion has ever done to you? Go away. There's no need to raise your voice. I'm right here. I just, I'm just curious if you have any sources to back up your opinion. You're in my house. You made a statement in public for all to hear. Are you unable to defend the statements you make? Or simply unwilling to have a reasoned discussion? I told you, dude. Sea lions. <laughs> I have been unfailingly polite. And you two have been nothing but rude. I'm trying to eat breakfast. Very well. We shall resume in an hour. So let's have a textual description of this. Sea lying is a type of trolling or harassment which consists of pursuing people with persistent requests for evidence or repeated questions. The harasser who uses this tactic also uses fake civility as to discredit their target. 
And we'll get a little bit back to this fake civility and this kind of tone. And this is the hard part, huh? Mansplaining. A lot of people get really stuck on the man part of mansplaining, but mansplaining does not talk about men explaining things, but it is a specific form of communication. It is an actual situation that is being described, not men explaining things. <laughs> we should have like a thing, men explaining things. Okay, sorry, I got distracted. Okay. The technical, th this is from Erin Brooke, she wrote an ar article which was based sort of on the Twitter thread from earlier. Uh, the technical definition of mansplaining is when a man explains something to a woman she already knows, often in a condescending tone. This often doesn't really bring to the table exactly how this is. It's generally explaining her specific expertise, her field, like, like somebody coming and is like, no, you don't know anything about it, and she wrote the book, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I'm going to explain to you how this works, and it's like, yeah, uh, you know that, okay, this book, I wrote that book. Um, but it can also be something like a man trying to explain women how periods work, which we always appreciate. <laughs> but before we continue, I want to talk about something, back to swearing again. When people are in pain, most people swear. Even people who are deadly polite in all sorts of other circumstances might actually swear. And might not be like a big swear, but it might be a little swear, but most people swear when they are in pain. So imagine that, you know, you uh, cut your leg. Let's do something really macho so you were chopping wood. <laughs> See, you know, and, and cutting your leg means basically you chopped into your leg, right? So you're, you're like, they're rolling you into the hospital and you're like in massive pain. You're screaming and swearing and you're basically like, okay, I, I don't know how sailors swear, but let's assume that it was massive, right? And then the doctor comes and goes like, okay, you need to calm down. You need to talk to me. No, 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 I, I don't want any of that swearing, okay? It's like, I will not, no, calm down, no, shh. I will not be able to talk to you until you talk like a normal, polite person. This is crazy, right? You would never do this. You know this person is in pain. You don't care if they're swearing. You don't care if they're screaming. You're basically asking, okay, so does, where does it hurt? It's like my tablet. <laughs> and it doesn't matter, right? Because you know, you see through it and you realize that these expressions, the swearing and the screaming, they're basically conveying a underlying pain, right? So that brings us to tone policing. Tone policing, I will read the definition. Drawing attention to the tone rather than content of a statement can allow other parties to avoid engaging with sound arguments presented in that statement, thus undermining the original party's attempt to communicate and effectively shutting them down. I will not listen to you until you stop screaming. <laughs> what you will see when you talk and listen to people who have been victims of systematic discrimination their entire lives is they are often in pain and they are often angry. And you know what? They have good reason to be. Like when you chopped your leg. Okay, this is, they, they have good reason to be. And sometimes some of the things that they will say will be hurtful to you because they, it hits you. They might say things like, I hate all men or, uh, or uh, white women are shit. Um, you have to get over that feeling of being defensive, over that feeling of I'm not like that because that is a very difficult thing to get over and realize that these people are in pain and try to listen to what they're actually saying. A good example of this, or a reaction that I don't want you to have, is not all men. Because this is a form of tone policing. If people are saying men are like this, or men are like that, and they are in a group where they have been living with systematic discrimination their entire life, they know not all men are like that. This is an expression of desperation, it's an expression of pain, it's an expression of hurt. And what you need to start doing is listening 
to what are they actually expressing, what are their feelings, what are the experiences that they're talking about, and not take it personally. They're not talking about you. But by focusing on yourself, by saying, yeah, but I'm not like this, you're taking the microwave, microphone away from someone who really we all need to listen to. Because they are expressing and they are brave enough to say out loud something we all need to hear. And yes, they're angry. But remember, when in pain, most people swear. They're angry. That's all right. Doesn't mean you should stop listening. So let's go back to the patterns of pro uh, problematic communication. Competitive communication style, you're out to win. Win over this person, and generally this person is someone who's already suffered, right? You're downplaying their issues and concerns. You're basically saying, it's not that bad. I don't really believe you. You're interpreting people as angry when they're actually in pain. And you're not trusting women's experiences and expertise. You're saying, you know what, I don't think you actually know anything. I know how it is to be a woman better than you. But what can you do? Remember this drawing about privilege is a myth, and then we come to privilege might be real? Hopefully I've gotten you to the point that, you know, privilege might be real. There might be something to this. And then I hope I'll get you to this. I believe this might be a problem, but I don't understand it. And that will make you listen to people. That will make you seek them out. Because that's what I want you to do. Start listening to people, educating yourself. Be aware that situations that you experience as uneventful, like going to the hairdresser or planning a vacation, can be hostile or even dangerous to other people. You can't imagine what it's like because you have never lived that life. Their life is different from yours. And their life is different for no other reason than their gender, their gender identity, their sexuality, their skin color, physical or psychological disability. Nothing of any fault of their own. They have suffered pains that you did not because you were lucky and you got another thing. So educate yourself. And by educating yourself, I mean Google. There's like lots of stuff to read, there's lots of videos to, to watch. Follow lots of people from underrepresented groups on Twitter and listen to what they say. But don't ask them to explain. Don't demand that they will educate you. They have enough on their plate. And just be grateful that they're bothering to say it out loud so that you have the possibility to learn. And then in your local little bubble at work, you have a concept of lending privilege. Lending privilege is using your privilege to lift somebody else up. If you know that you have respect, you have power at work, people respect you, people listen to you, you can use that to bring somebody else with you. <coughs> Say that, you know what, on this new project, which is really exciting, I really want Joan to help me. I think she's brilliant. And that is using your privilege, your power, your social capital to help someone else get opportunities that they might not otherwise have gotten. You react when they're ignored in a meeting. You know, when somebody says something and nobody reacts to it, you go like, I think that what Jane just said was great. I, that is a really good idea. That is using your social capital. It's not being angry. You don't have to be angry, but you're using your status to lift somebody else. Call out your peers on their prejudice. If people are sitting around in a corner discussing, you know, whether or not they thought that some female speaker was hot, you go like, you know what, I don't think that's an appropriate way to talk about her. I think she's brilliant and I don't like that you do that. Again, you don't have to be really bad. You don't have to, to, to burn all the many social bridges. And you can support them by sponsoring their careers. And when I say sponsoring, it's different than mentoring. Sponsoring is basically you're burning your own capital for this. You're saying that for these jobs, for this position, I recommend this person. I think they're really smart. And now you are actually putting your reputation on the line for somebody else. This is not something that is without cost. 
But that is a way that you can use that power, that leverage that you have. And since we have a little bit of time, I want to um, play a little video for you. So let's see. Let's see if I can. Take two steps forward if both of your parents are still married. Take two steps forward if you grew up with a father figure in the home. Take two steps forward if you had access to a private education. Take two steps forward if you had access to a free tutor growing up. Take two steps forward if you've never had to worry about your cell phone being shut off. Take two steps forward if you never had to help mom or dad with the bills. Take two steps forward if it wasn't because of your athletic ability, you don't have to pay for college. Take two steps forward if you never wondered where your next meal was going to come from. I want you guys up here in the front just to turn around and look. Every statement I've made has nothing to do with anything any of you have done. Has nothing to do with decisions you've made. Everything I have said has nothing to do with what you've done. We all know these people up here have a better opportunity to win this hundred dollars. Does that mean these people back here can't race? No. We would be foolish to not realize we've been given more opportunity. We don't want to recognize that we've been given a head start. But the reality is we have. Now, there's no excuse. They still got to run their race. You still got to run your race. But whoever wins this hundred dollars, I think it'd be extremely foolish of you not to utilize that and learn more about somebody else's story. Because what you see his privilege is being spared a hardship, but it is also a compound interest. You have one, then you have another. The more you have, the better it is. These things stack up. Being white, yeah, it gives you privilege. Being a white man gives you more. Being a white straight man gives you even more. These things stack up, and so people are not starting from a level playing field. There is no level playing field. But none of this means that your life was easy. Just because you have one or many of these privileges doesn't mean your life was easy. It just means that these specific burdens, you were spared for those. You were spared from those. But as we all become aware of our privileges, it opens us up to listening. It opens us up to learning from others. And that is how we become better people. That is how we become better Partners, that's how we become better colleagues. And that is my talk. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can come and talk to me after the talk. Thank you.